Dan. To the how-to heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. I'm Uncle Dan. I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is your first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you'd better make the most of it. Well, dearest uncle hello. people. Hello. Yes. Hello, hello. Again, here we are, episode 117. In a string of 117. We, exactly. Every, <laughs> Unbroken string. It's interesting because every show we do is the last one we've done. Ooh. And the math checks out. I don't know how we did it, but we did it <laughs> because Boom. we're not that smart. So we got a, we got a show. It's, a, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster. It's a little up. It's a little down. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I think I kind of hit the middle note. Uh, with, uh, we talk about um, the worst daycare center in the world. Yes, indeed. <laughs> that is well, in the world. Yeah. Yeah, and I definitely hit the low note. We're going to talk about the poor Uyghurs in China. That's right. Oh, God. And I hear those sleigh bells ringling, ring ting tingling. Boo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> figure out. We, we, I'm bringing Paige back onto the show so that we can all figure out what we're supposed to do with our families at Christmas time. Burn them. Burn them. Kill it with fire. All right. Well, without further ado, let's just dive right in. (laughs) Hey, Uncle Doug. Uncle Dan. Uh, You know, uh, I don't know. Do you ever feel stuck? (laughs) I just did. (laughs) Right there. I just thought, you know... I might just quit the show. I got nothing to say. That was like a diver running to the end of the diving board and not realizing they don't know what they're about to do next. <laughs> right. <laughs> springing into the air. I'm like a child who's, who starts a joke that has no end to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big lover of improvisational diving, by the way. I think that's really... <laughs> You guys, you guys were both swimmers, but I was the improvisational diver. We actually yeah. used to play a game, Uncle Mark, if you remember this, uh, from time to time we'd play it at workout, where... You'd run to the end of the diving board, and then yeah. just as you come down to the bottom of the spring, yeah. somebody would yell either dive, jump, or flip, yeah. and you had to do that. Uh-huh. And, it, and was, it, turned, it never was any of those. It was some right. horrible <laughs> hybrid just, near just death. Just a flailing belly flop. Yeah, totally. Yes. <laughs> it was beautiful. So, well, for you guys feeling stuck, I might, I might have a little something for, for you. And, you know, guys, we, we, we have some laughs and, and some yucks on, on the show talking about the harm religion almost inevitably does to anyone who has the bad luck of coming in contact with it. But it's important among all the laughter and the good times not to forget the harm religion inevitably does to anyone who has the bad luck of coming in contact with it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the harm is huge, like teenage girls being burnt alive because somebody thought they saw them talking to a black cat. Or it can be small, like the children of Jehovah's Witnesses never getting birthday presents. But, yeah, mean, why? But religion cannot, will not rest until somebody gets hurt. So (laughs) today I want to talk about one such totally needless source of pain that the vicious, venal, and vainglorious virgins at the Vatican have casually inflicted on their long-suffering parishioners since, checks notes, about the 4th century AD. And that utterly pointless, insidious sort of evil is a very stupid thing called in Latin in the Latin of the Pope Limbus Infantium or in the Queen's English the Limbo of the Infants. Ooh. So recall with me, dear uncles. So we're two- talking we're talking about people who can't even walk somehow making it under that pole, which I think <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> well so there's, I, there's- say, I thought Limbo of the Infants was Sting's second album. <laughs> <laughs> well they're so goopy that they can just slide right under the oh, yeah. <laughs> the limbo <laughs> stick, right? <laughs> you no. get one of the you, you gotta get one of those curling brooms to to go in front of them and so you, exactly. you gotta cl- you gotta clean your infant from time to time. So lubed they are with amniotic grease. So <laughs> anyway, and then they're snapped back by the by the cord. It's a pretty exciting thing to see. <laughs> we don't so, have kids. We, <laughs> baby yo-yos is our entire idea of how children work. <laughs> so recall with me, dear uncles, our two partner on hell in episodes seventy six and seventy seven, where we explored how forget. 
It was so it was it was everything. We explored yeah. how what we all think of as the Christian canonical canonical idea of canonical canonical yeah that's better bananical <laughs> idea of hell is not really canonical at all. And in fact, more than most things Christian is a blatantly stitched together scarecrow of other cultures' older ideas by horrible bastards like Augustine of Hippo in order to scare the masses shitless and force them to conform to his beloved church uh, and himself. Well, the limbo of the infants is another part of that ghastly after factory retrofit for terrorizing the commoners. Mm. Now, so we're clear the limbo of the infants is not to be confused with the limbo of the patriarchs. Which we can talk about in full another time, but in brief, that limbo is the one where all the air quotes good guys of the Old Testament went to be in more of a simmer rather than a full boil of hell for hundreds of years until Jesus was born, got his unkillable ass crucified, and played dead for three whole days during which he flew down to hell to release, and I cannot stress this enough, the good guys of the Old Testament from the antechamber of hell where they had been chafing for centuries until he came to free them. I'm talking about Adam and Abraham, fucking Abraham, Moses, Noah, David, Isaiah, maybe some women without names, but probably not, etc. Right. This this is called the harrowing of hell, and it's a very stupid idea indeed. But it, it just illustrates if the all-loving, all-forgiving Christian God thinks the reward for his greatest and most faithful prophets was centuries in hell for the ser- for their service. Fuck that guy. Don't be his friend. In fact, <laughs> delete his number and unfriend him on Facebook. He's that terrible. So, that seems extreme, but okay. I know it's extreme, but this is how he treats his best friends, right? Yeah. So, yeah, no. That's a different limbo. Same neighborhood, different house. No, the limbo of the infants is the outer edge of hell. Yes, hell, where babies, yes, babies, Go forever for the unforgivable sin of failing to get their days old selves bad baptized before they died. Oh no! Can oh. you believe the carelessness and the lack of planning and foresight it takes for an infant to fuck up that badly? It it's, just seems so simple. It's it, the, that's the one thing you got to remember to especially do. Especially if they knew they were going to die. Fucking you had stupid one baby. job, baby. <laughs> one stupid job, baby. But why is dying before getting a little bit wet by the hand of a creepy old Catholic priest that is very much looking forward to you blossoming into a sexy nine-year-old in a few short years oh. such a problem <laughs> is a question our baby listeners are surely asking. Yeah. Well, baby <laughs> listener, long before you were born, <clears throat> almost 6,000 years ago, a man made of mud was exhausted by having just named all 8.7 million species on Earth, Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, look it up was tempted by a female clone made from his rib, who was herself tempted by a talking snake to eat an apple, forcing them to realize they were critically underdressed. And so now women get periods. Boom, original sin. You're as fucking guilty of it as those first apple eaters God created and made perfect, but failed to foresee the dangers of an apple tree that revealed their nakedness in a garden full of fruit-bearing trees and bushes he made for them to eat from. So fuck you, baby. But also thank I you for your like excellent question, baby. Uh, uh, also... Look for our new album coming out. Fuck you, baby! It, <laughs> it drops uh, in January, and it's it's to the tune of Santa Baby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, baby. <laughs> so I hope that clears things up. Pro tip: uh, if you want to really understand the galactic, internally incoherent, embarrassingly awful mess of Genesis, just go ahead and read it. Or you could listen to Dan's sandblasting of Genesis one and two in episode sixty-five of our show, and then just search for more segments on Genesis. It's one of our most favorite punching bags. It's too easy. Or, or go to the Answers in Genesis website and realize that they actually don't have any. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, it's as funny as our show, I hope, for you. So <laughs> anyway, back to you, you poor hellbound baby. So two people who, unlike you, were created as fully formed adults. So that's incongruent narrative. Quirk, a, a good editor of The Supreme Being, maybe should have caught prior to publication, had a single serving of fruit, and yada, 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 you were evil at the moment of conception. Proper planning and just a I little bit of... I hate when that happens. Uh, proper planning and a little bit of luck would have had you moistened with holy water. And also, we did a whole thing on holy water, which I just listened to again the other day in episode 37. It's gross and hilarious. But oops, <laughs> you died, like probably millions of pre-baptized babies born to Catholic families, ever since the throne of St. Peter cast its gruesome shadow over this luckless world. I should point out <clears throat> that despite being technically in the greater hell metropolitan area, 
or the GHMA, as the locals call it. The, <laughs> the limbo of the infants is not the full-on pitchfork stabby on a barbecue spit forever part of hell. That's, down, that's downtown. So <laughs> the limbo of the infants is not set to broil, but is rather a place where the baby's souls spend eternity sad that they are not in the presence of God, who killed them, but then won't let them come and hang out with him, which is rude and also stupid and also monstrously fucked up when you think about it like that. So they just linger in relative contentment, but also eternal disappointment for not making it to the font on time through no fault of their own. And they stay babies. They stay babies forever. Um, <laughs> so this just this field full of, is it zero gravity? <laughs> I hope. Well, I hope it is. Yeah, it's a big womb. It's a giant amniotic <laughs> sack, like but the size of un- Jupiter. But it's mildly uncomfortable. It's like that mm-hmm. scene in The Matrix where Neo wakes up. It's very. It's exactly like that. <laughs> um, and yes, this awful idea is purely made up trash that the Catholic hierarchy could have, at any point over almost two thousand years, just deleted and said, "Yeah, babies are all good," but still have not bothered to do. But but just to put the diabolically evil nature of the Catholic idea of the fate of tragically deceased infants in perspective, let's do a little comparative shopping among some of the other truly terrible, hopeless and cruel religions to see how they stack up, shall we? Hooray! Yeah, a little little bargain shop, a little comparative shopping. The Jehovah's Witnesses. The answer a supercomputer would spit out if asked what the polar opposite of good times is. What do they think? (laughs) What do they think happens to babies who die before baptism? It must be as awful as everything else they believe, right? Nope. For them, deceased babies just go into power saver mode until Judgment Day, upon which they're received with the sheep into the presence of God. So lucky baby. All right. So the answer is murder the babies, and then everybody gets to go to heaven. I think that's what I'm driving at here, right? Yeah. (laughs) Muslims. I'll bet you guys are thinking they've got a particularly harsh fate in store for any and all infidels, no matter how small, right? Hmm. Nope again. Firstly, they reject the ghastly idea of original sin totally. So babies are not born broken. And those that, well, die before, those that die before finding Allah in prison are automatically considered sinless Muslims, regardless of the faith their families were born into. And they go directly to heaven, where they are taken care of by no less a personage than Abraham himself. Oh, <laughs> How about that? Love it. How about well, that? There you go. Keen listeners will note that Abraham maybe isn't the most trustworthy daycare provider. But rolling the dice with old stabby dad beats the suburbs of hell for sure. He will so, definitely circumcise them, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, just manners. As um, he should. <laughs> what about the Mormons? They're no goddamn fun, as we three can definitely confirm. <laughs> <laughs> what eternal vanilla torment do they have for the, the pre-baptized, post-deceased in your life? Something truly dreadful, right? Wrong! Gods, you guys! Children who die before their baptism at age eight become gods of their own fucking planets forever and ever. Mormons are the best. I would would love it if they stayed babies, though. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, the Mormon thing is, uh, they. I mean, you say they become gods, but they have to get married first. Even though they never... They never actually got to be grown-ups on Earth. They eventually have to be grown-ups in the in the afterlife and and take themselves a spouse. It's like well, a show on CBS, Baby God, <laughs> coming te- Fridays. Technicality. Hi to, I feel like hi to collab I feel five. Like, I want to know how the God of the Bible isn't Baby God. He's an infant. <laughs> yeah, he's a total infant. Totally. So, <clears throat> in this way, like so many others, Catholicism is uniquely awful. It's all made up. Why be so needlessly mean to parents who've suffered uh, the devastating loss of an infant? And So un- true. Re- why? And unlike almost everything else in Catholicism, you can't buy your way out of limbo of the infants. There, there's no indulgence the rich can pay the Pope, no saintly intercession, no prayers, nada. Your baby is essentially in hell, albeit the nicest part of hell, forever, and that's just tough shit. Wow. So, The Vatican has a strange sort of don't ask, don't tell stance on the limbo of the infants, (laughs) (laughs) claiming it isn't exactly official church doctrine, but also never having come right out to say it's bullshit. The the most recent popes have tried to take the jagged edge off this horrendous idea as modernity continues to expose the church as a vile and regressive institution, saying that maybe the mother wishing for the baby to be baptized would send them to glory, but only if they died in the womb pre-birth. Or 
this is amazing, that God himself is the only being free from the doctrines and commandments of the church. So maybe <laughs> he's made a workaround to spare infants from hell, but nobody really knows. Stop asking, suck it. He can grant a pardon to babies, but not to sinners. Yes. Can he kill a baby so big that he can't? No way. How does that work? I can't remember how that works. Anyway, nobody does. Uh, when the person who is absolutely not Emperor Palpatine, but you've never seen them in the same room at the same time, Pope Benedict XVI, <laughs> authorized a very tepid, non-committal church conclusion on their non-official but never disavowed policy of the limbo of the infants, the New York Times gushingly reported, Vatican City, Pope closes limbo, when in fact he did no such thing. Right. Yeah, and that was in 2009. <clears throat> but wouldn't it be so, great if, if then he started, he got so much good publicity from that that he just started going on a, on a like, closing spree and started, uh, you know what? Fuck it. We're not, we're not going to do hell anymore either. That, Fuck it. We're, you know what? It's all good. Priests, you can get married. That's right. Dan, I am touched by your faith in Pope Benedict XVI, but uh, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> maybe one yeah. day. Cardinal well, he, Ratzinger was ironically yeah. the uh, the guy that was going to do that for sure. Ironically, most children named Dan have been touched by the Pope himself. <laughs> Anywho, quick aside: <laughs> Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, formerly Joseph Ratzinger, as, as Dan said, also formerly a Pope, as he is formerly Pope, as he is now a very unusual retired Pope Emeritus. Yeah, y one of what used two? I think two ever. <clears throat> uh, he used to be in charge of one of the oldest and worst departments at the Vatican called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, itself formerly called simply the Inquisition. If evil has an eviler part, that's what the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith is. They're, <laughs> they're basically the Sith, right? Um, but part of what this former pope did as head of, of the Inquisition in his pre-pope days was to gather as many of the church's files on pedophile priests and their victims behind the sovereign walls of the pretend nation of the Vatican as possible hiding them forever from local and international laws, pardon me, re-victimizing re his precious church's juvenile victims and adding callous insult to grievous injury. This is, this is the fucker that worked tirelessly to make sure victims of childhood rape and abuse would never be able to find some small relief from their struggles and people think he was going to close limbo, easing the pain of countless grieving parents, agonizing over their babies forever in hell? Yeah, fat fucking chance. <laughs> giving a shit about children and their families was never has never been on Ratzinger's to-do list. He eventually said, yeah, babies in hell sucks, but who's got time to think about that with all these gays to hate? Am I right? Um, <laughs> so for serious true-believing Catholics, the limbo of the infants is still a very real thing. And for those that have lost unbaptized children, it's a brutal, emotionally devastating cross to have to bear throughout the rest of their lives. And this is the whole point, isn't it, guys? Organized religion is terrorism. Keeping mm. people afraid and in pain is a way to keep their butts in the pews and their coins in the collection plate. And fear, as we know from psychology, is more motivating than love, especially if you give people no reason to love you. So <laughs> tell people they're sick and it's, it's likely terminal, but luckily you have the cure and it might just work, for, uh, work if they do exactly what you say and they'll beg you for it. So... Limbo is pointlessly cruel unless you understand the cruelty is the point. Again, right. they could change at any time, but they don't. Most weirdly it's, for the assholes in the Vatican, like I mentioned above, they haven't turned it into this, this market of bereaved and devastated families into a cash cow like they have almost everything else. But uh, I guess when you're, when you're more shitty and incoherent and, than you are callous, I don't know. This is what you get. And so yeah. in conclusion... Da, 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 da. Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's fair. Yeah. 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 So that's the limbo of the infants, guys. If you're a baby out there, please get yourself get yourself down to the abbey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, go get some fecal matter containing water smeared <laughs> yeah. on you. Go get some staphylococcus <laughs> all up on your head. And you'll it's, it's good you for won't you. go to hell. Yeah. Hooray! All, all right. right, let's move on before uh, we all get staphylococcus. <laughs> Uncle Dan. Hey, yo. You know, uh, we occasionally we like to dip a toe into the, the very rare, very, 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 uh, uh, very rare. Infrequent. Hmm. Infrequent bad side of religion. 
Yeah, it's almost like it's it's shocking to learn that it even could happen. But every yeah. now and then, yeah, something there's a bit of nastiness out there in the world, and it can happen with tiny little uh, enclaves of religions yeah. that yes. you don't even know exist. Yeah, so I think Uncle Doug has an exciting new oppression expression for us this week, huh? I do, and I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball in, in, in which a an atheist regime is stomping on the throat of a religious um, mm. uh, group. Fun. Yeah, that's um, nice. If, yeah, it's good to hear that it can go all the different directions. Yeah, and if it makes you feel better, there's a lot of people who suffer, so don't mm. worry. Hooray! Yeah. Um, well, dear uncles, we are what we would call an atheist podcast, mostly because mm. of all of the things we say. <laughs> and it is our editorial position that less religion is better and no religion is best. Unfortunately, history has provided us with precious few examples of a truly religion-free society. Um, the only truly atheist society that I'm aware of was the very short-lived and disastrous cult of reason yeah. in France that we covered back in episode 95. If I am wrong, please do at me. Um... The other examples that religious people always try and throw in our faces are, of course, Soviet Russia, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Hitler's Germany, North Korea, communist China. Mm. <clears throat> no matter how many times you debunk this argument, it never really goes away. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, the Nazis can all walk around with the phrase, Gott mit uns, yeah. God is with us, on their belt buckles, and yet uh, they're supposed to be an atheist. Exactly. So, so let's strike that one. They're the most obvious one from the list, because like you were saying, Uncle Dan... Hitler's Germany was avowedly religious and, until very late in the game, fully sanctioned by the Vatican. Right. Although all of the rest of these regimes tried and are trying to cast off religions that had previously oppressed their peoples, they are truly among the most religious societies in the world. It's just that the religion is the state. Yeah. Uh, watch the video of when Kim Il-sung died and tell me that's, not an, a that's an atheist society. Mm. Yeah. It's so, a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult. Yeah. yeah. Um, What's crazy is that we seem to be experience, experiencing the simultaneous collapse and ascension of religion in the West, so it bears mentioning that at least one out of every six people on the planet reside in a country that on its face claims to be atheist. I'm talking, of course, about communist China. Mm. In spite of the protests we are witnessing in Hong Kong, which as of this recording have not yet been totally and violently crushed, yeah. the Chinese government has been very effective in keeping its population in check, with the notable, notable exceptions of Falun Gong which we covered back in episode 60, and, of course, the Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989, which possibly killed thousands of people. I think there's something amazing about the fact that you're talking about Tiananmen Square and all of this cracking down, and then from somewhere in Canada, we hear a siren. <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to mute my mic. I, I, my hotel is like two blocks from a huge hospital here, so just be warned. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a sound effect Cody put in for us. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, about 92% of the estimated 1.3 billion people in China are of the Han Chinese ethnic group. And so if China is willing to drive tanks into crowds of its own ethnic group, imagine the alacrity they would bring to repressing any one of the 52 officially recognized ethnic groups that make up the other 8%. Well, meet the Uyghurs. <laughs> Which was a great show back in the 50s. Do you remember that show? Yeah, right I just after thought the, the laugh track was so canned, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, but I mean, that was just part <laughs> yeah. of the deal. Yeah. So uh, the Uyghurs are an ethnic and religious minority in Central Asia. The highest concentration of Uyghurs is in the northwest Shan, uh, Xinjiang province of China, bordering Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, there so are a lot of stands. A lot of stands, almost all the stands. Uh, there are smaller Uyghur communities in all of those countries with some very small diasporic communities in, the, in Western countries. But the vast majority live in Xinjiang. Quick disclaimer, I'm going to say a lot of Uyghur and Chinese words, and I'm going to say them wrong. Yeah. <laughs> if this bothers you, why don't you he head on over to the Get Bent podcast and see how you like them, Apples. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I, I like your uh, preemptive uh, <laughs> anger. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm both pre and post. Um, <laughs> in the Xinjiang province, 80% of the 11 million Uyghurs live in uh, oases strewn throughout the Taklamakan Desert of the Tarim Basin. The Taklamakan Desert is definitely worth a look on Google Earth. Hmm. It's like God took an eraser to the map and just blotted out an enormous section. Hmm. Uh, most of the Uyghurs in this area live in the oasis cities of Urumqi, Urumqi and Kashgar. Whoa. The Uyghurs have been in the news lately, although not nearly enough, because a hmm. fat racist circus clown rage tweeting at a teenage girl is sucking up most of the news cycle. 
They have been in the news because China, who let's just say has been less than kind to this minority in the past, has decided to see if they can't break some human rights records. Hmm. Right now, <clears throat> as we speak, somewhere between 1 million and 2 million of China's estimated 11 million Uyghurs are in what are called re-education camps spread throughout Xinjiang. Uh, that's at least 1 in 10. And a cultural and surveillance state experiment is taking place, the likes of which have never been seen before outside of dystopian fiction. So imagine if the unemployment rate in this country was 10%, we would be in a major depression or if not uh, a major recession, if not a depression. Right. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that it's not a 10% unemployment rate, but a 10% disappearance rate. Oh my God. And in typical communist Chinese fashion, that 10% 10 is made up of the most crucial members of a society, professors, Mm -hmm. intellectuals, doctors, et cetera. Can you imagine what that must be like? So, I mean, I think every group in history has the 10% group that they could imagine leaving and have a smile on their face. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, said, you said imagine all of these professors leaving, and I was like, Liberty University, yeah. I <laughs> um, before we dig into that fuck nugget, let's go back and look at, uh, at the Uyghurs, who they are, and how they ended up on the business end of 21st century ethnic obliteration. And how you spell it. Oh, that's, uh, there's various spellings. The one that's most common is U-Y-G-H-U-R-S, Uyghurs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, think, I think we did that wrong. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> uh, the Uyghurs are a Turkic people who have far more in common with their immediate neighbors in Mongolia and the stands of the steppe than they do with the Han Chinese. There are many theories about the origins of the name, but the real reason is most likely lost to the mists of time. Hmm. The Uyghurs consider themselves to be the original settlers of, of Xinjiang, with some accounts having them go back as far as 9,000 years. It was probably not that long ago, but they have been there for a very long time. The Chinese government claims that they only arrived in the 9th century and that they displaced the original Han Chinese uh, inhabitants. More on that in a minute. (laughs) As you might imagine, inhabiting a region of the world for thousands of years that basically every single European and Asian empire wanted a piece of leaves behind a rich history, rich and complicated history that makes one feel ignorant and small. The Mongols, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Iranians, the Syrians, and the Turks, among many others, all spent time killing and fucking in that region. Mm. Religiously, they may have been practitioners of the proto-Indo-European religion we talked about way back in episode 10, before becoming Manichaean, then Buddhist, and then finally settling on Islam. Uh, The conversion of of Xinjiang to uh, Islam started in the 10th century, but was not completed until the 17th century. Uh, brings us close to the modern day when in 1759, the King Chinese military invaded Xinjiang to once and for all defeat the rebellious Buddhist Dzungars who ruled at the time. Not seeing Islam as a threat, the Chinese tolerated and even encouraged it as a better alternative than Buddhism. They do not know the Islam that we know. They would later change their minds. Uh, the Chinese would never leave Xinjiang again and in typical fashion ruled with an iron fist. The transition of the Qing Dynasty to the Republic of China did nothing for the Uyghurs, who rebelled and managed to gain independence twice, uh, once in 1933 and again in 1944. They were backed by Joseph Stalin as a way of giving himself a bit of a buffer with China and fucking with China. The first rebellion resulted in the first East Turkestan Republic, but that only lasted a year before the Chinese regained control. The second rebellion lasted from 1944 to 1949 and resulted in the second East Turkestan Republic. But when Mao Zedong founded the Communist People's Republic of China in 1949, Stalin withdrew his support for the Uyghurs, and they were once again crushed by the Chinese. It's a happy story. Yeah. Um, Thank goodness for that. Yeah. The Uyghurs have never given up on their dream of independence, so a low-level struggle has uh, existed ever since, occasionally flaring up into violence. China is not known for giving up territory, and they consider Xinjiang to be an important buffer against the West, as well as having a lot of coal and oil. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, they wouldn't care otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So Mao embarked on a program of resettling the Han Chinese uh, into Xinjiang in order to dilute and hopefully finally eradicate the Uyghurs. As of now, half the population of of Xinjiang is Han Chinese. Hmm. So the Han Chinese were given incentives to move. And then once there, they were they were and still are given priority in hiring, promotions, salary, medical care, etc. This has done little to engender racial harmony. And in 2009, things got out of hand. Two Uyghur factory workers were accused of raping a Han Chinese girl and were beaten to death by a crowd. The Uyghurs responded, and the ensuing Urumqi riots uh, resulted in around 200 deaths and over 1,000 injuries. Hmm. This was a black eye for the Chinese government that had just pulled off the 2008 Beijing Olympics 
as basically their entry into the modern community of families or a modern community of nations. Uh, although China is officially atheist, they had tolerated the Uyghurs' practice of Islam mostly. But now the Chinese government imposed a draconian set of anti-religious laws, such as prohibiting the growing of beards, owning of prayer rugs or Korans, and they actually made it illegal to quit smoking or drinking. <laughs> what? what? Yeah. Holy shit. That is awesome. I'm, they meaning are <laughs> just... I, like, if you're going to fuck with a community of people... Go hard. <laughs> go hard or go home. Meaning you have to smoke and drink? Or you I just, don't know how if they, you I, do, you can't stop? If you start, yeah. you're, that's it. That's your life for ne- from now on. I couldn't find how they enforce that law, but they have well, it. Well, there's, there's a long history of that kind of shit. Like when you know the English took over uh, after um, Cromwell, when the English took over most of Ireland, you know, the speaking the Irish was illegal. Food, the right. traditional foods were illegal. Yeah, you, you just kind of erase the culture. Exactly. Right. And that, that's the intention. Yeah. Um, uh, jumping up to 2014, President Xi Jinping went to Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang to see firsthand how things were proceeding. And while on the ground there, there was a car bombing and a knife attack in a train station where Uyghur separatists stabbed over 150 people. Holy mm-hmm. moly. Yeah. What the Chinese government has decided to do in, in Xinjiang as a result has been, let's just say, a bit of an overreaction. <laughs> um, nothing like what is happening in Xinjiang has ever happened before in human history. A surveillance and internet state and, and internment state is being imposed on the Uyghur population that George Orwell could never have imagined. Hmm. Uh, most of this comes from the New York Times, who's been doing incredible reporting on this for several years. But as you might imagine, it's not easy to get reporters on the ground yeah. or get sources to report what they are seeing. Right. After the violence in 2014, the Chinese government essentially turned off Xinjiang it's nearly impossible to get in or out, and social media is not allowed. Um, so then, just a few days ago... And everybody's ago, just smoking and drunk. It's just a fucking <laughs> wreck. Uh, just a few days ago, someone much braver than me leaked f- nearly 400 pages of internal Chinese government documents wow. detailing some of what's going on in Xinjiang. Basically, there are cameras everywhere with facial recognition software. Yeah, I mean, everywhere, at intersections, telephone poles, stores, mosques, subways, buses, etc. Some are meant to be seen, and some are not, and are hidden. Uh, there is nowhere you can go in Xinjiang where you are not seen, recognized, or logged. Uh, and by the way, Xinjiang is 640,000 square miles, basically the same size as Alaska. Holy shit. The what? Chinese government has set up checkpoints on nearly every block and have what they call, uh, quote, concern... Uh, convenience police stations every couple of blocks. This is crazy. Uyghurs have to have their IDs scanned and are photographed anywhere they go, often several times. A a couple years ago, all Uyghurs were required to report for mandatory medical examinations in which blood, saliva, hair, and biometric data were taken. All of this is going on to one huge database. And then there are the camps. Which, I I mean... this is all, I, you're getting to the most horrific. It's all kind of horrific. But I do want to point out, what a great opportunity for us to study some people. We have all of their information. <laughs> yes. yes. There, exactly. At some point, I'm sure scientists will learn a lot from this. Yes. <laughs> I, what, what wonderful silver lining there to find Dr. Mengele. That's the, <laughs> yeah. That, so, the, the, it will put medical research ahead years. Yes, Exactly. <laughs> Um, the, in the camps, basically anyone who has said anything negative about the government has a criminal record or is perceived to be sour on their current state of affairs has been swept up and interned in one of the many camps that have been built around the, uh, the region in the last couple of years. Like I said at the beginning, there are currently between one to two million Uyghurs in these camps and they are building more. Um, wow. the initial stint in one of these camps is one year, but this can be extended if one does not show proper, uh, reeducation. This is fucked up. Or if one's family is not properly deferential. This includes family abroad. So if your relative is in a camp and you happen to live in the U.S., for example, the Chinese government is monitoring your social media. And if you say anything negative about the situation, they will add months to your relative's incarceration and they may even sweep up more of your family. I mean, at this point, do you really even ever hope for being able for getting out? Like, I... It seems like it would be foolhardy to even believe that you're ever going to leave that place. I don't. I, I agree. Um, they've even produced pamphlets for people to use when talking to their children about why mommy or daddy has vanished. Oh my uh, god! And the talking points are chilling. 
It starts off with some pretty anodyne things like they're off at school and they're being taken, uh, well taken care of. But if the child persists in asking questions, the talking points drop all pretense and pretty much tell the child, stop asking questions or mommy will never come home. Oh my God. As you might imagine, the climate of fear this has produced is paralyzing. Mosques are closed, the streets are empty, and people are not even sure if they are being monitored and filmed in their own houses. Um, What the Chinese government is doing with this database uh, and what their long-term plans are for these camps is not known, but it cannot be good. Um, it has been the long-stated goal for, uh, of the Chinese government uh, to undergo to, uh, the Chinese government to go through sinicization with all of these ethnic groups. That is to say, the destruction of all non-Chinese cultural and religious practices and the full assimil- assimilation of non-Han Chinese ethnicities. But it was a really long-term plan. It seems that with the Uyghurs, they've decided to speed things up a bit. So. All of this is to say that we may be witnessing the end of, a, of an ethnicity and a culture that goes back thousands of years. They are being eradicated because they are different, for sure, but mostly because they are Muslim. Yeah. Uh, s- several Western countries have sent milk toast letters of condemnation to China and the UN, urging China to free the Uyghurs. But in July of this year, ambassador, ambassadors from 37 countries signed a joint letter to the UN Human Rights Council supporting China's actions. What? what? This list included ambassadors from Saudi Arabia, Syria, oh. Pakistan, Kuwait, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. Muslim That's countries? Some, some of the most powerful and wealthy Muslim countries in the world. That is insane. Throwing their support behind the almost certain genocide of a Muslim population. Now, before Jesus you ask, Christ. the United States was not on the list of countries supporting China. I'm almost shocked that that's the case. But it was yeah. also not on the list of countries condemning China. Right. Um, just days ago, Mike Pompeo, um, Secretary of State, was to announce sanctions on Chinese officials linked to this terror, but his piece of shit boss wants a trade deal with China, so suck it, Uyghurs. Uh, just to be clear, the trade deal that Trump has just announced with China is called the Phase 1 deal. It's Phase 1 because Trump kicked all the difficult issues into Phase 2 right. so that he could, he could announce this non-deal and try and distract from impeachment. So he could have a, a win that means nothing. I just want to put that little cherry on top of yeah. the shit Quick Sunday. question. What, is the, what possible motivation – I mean, it's probably just money, but why, why would the Saudis and the Bahrainis and – why would they not – why would they uh, – Because they, they like repression more than they like fellow Muslims. Wow. And what China – this is the thing. What China is doing is demonstrating to the world – that this can be done. That right. you, can, yeah. you can have a complete and total police state and completely eliminate uh, opposition. And countries like Saudi Arabia are down. Yeah, they're pretty excited about that prospect. Um, wow. Now, with the cat fully out of the bag, the Chinese government's response to this has been pretty much, so what? Um, there's, a, there's not a lot of momentum to doing anything about this. And unless we vote Trump out next year, the U.S. will not be a part of any effort to stop it. Yeah, so, I mean, say what you want about U.S. real politique and the the quote unquote Western order, but it was available as a you know as a counterbalance to things like this. There were right. there were methods to try to curb these terrible things if people were willing to do it, but that's gone. Yep. that's completely gone. Yeah, with I Trump. mean, when when we had presidents that had e- any sense of moral morality whatsoever and yeah. that's not that's not a democrat or republican thing that's right. just a humanity thing yeah yeah and you know a congress that was peopled by the same we were a bulwark against this sort yeah. of thing to some extent because everybody needed to trade with us so we yeah. were able to to put a, extreme pressure on these on on these countries exactly. to to treat people decently but we don't have that now and the chinese are clearly uh they they see that completely. It's 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 uh, it's obvious to everybody. It's, bra- it's whatever bra- the behavior is rather brazen, isn't it? Even though they're trying to, there certain aspects of it are kind of under lock and key and kept quite secret. It's not a secret that they're doing it. No, right? and, and they're not right. really denying it. And whatever it is they're doing with these camps and this bio, this this surveillance state, they have a plan. What yeah. that plan is, we don't know. But like I said, it, it it can't be good. I don't know. It's giving them a lot of credit. To say that they have a plan, I I think a lot of times we assume a plan and for, uh, from you know higher ups who are doing stuff. I they may not ha- have a plan. It may just be build a bunch of camps. I mean that's what we do. We build a bunch of camps here. We you know we separate children from their families or whatever. And then when, when people are like, and what's step two? Right. We go. 
I don't know. I will say if if the Chinese are famous for anything, it's having a plan. That's what I was going to say. It's long-term thinking. Yeah, they're they're long-term thinkers. They've had it with the Uyghurs. Whatever they're doing is, you know, sorry to say, some kind of final solution. Yeah. Um, So um, a soccer player today, this happened just today. Uh, On Friday, a soccer player named Mesut Ozil, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, from Arsenal in England, spoke out against the Chinese government um, and spoke out against other Muslim countries not doing anything to support Muslim populations. Um, so the Chinese government today canceled the broadcast broadcast of his game in China. So, there well, that go. happened with the uh, with uh, one of the U.S. professional basketball teams, right? One of their yes a coach, I think, tweeted a coach out. of yes, he, he tweeted support for the uh, Hong Kong protesters. Oh, Hong Kong, that was it. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and uh, the Chinese government brought the fucking hammer down on the NBA, and the M- NBA's biggest market after the U.S. is China. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, Fun. Hey, thanks you're for welcome. Thanks for uh, the big pick me up there, Uncle Doug. That was delightful. Anytime. But yeah, go out there and uh, and tweet your support for Uyghurs and watch an entire country hate you. <laughs> yeah, I think we just will we will have, we will lose our four Chinese listeners unfortunately after this episode. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's dry our tears a little bit and move on. Yeah. Good luck, Uyghurs. Gentlemen, hello. Hi. I, oh, hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Uh, Good. How about you? I'm great. And you know what Good. makes you want to know why I'm great? Mm. Uh, the reason why I'm great is because I we put a thing out into the world. We do. It's a thing that yeah. we put some effort into each week. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cut, cut it out. <laughs> of varying and, degrees. Yes. And various people uh, listen to it and appreciate it. And some of those people have shown their appreciation in the special way that we like to call forking over some dash for and we, us. We love you for that. We don't do ads, and you must love that. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's a quid pro quo sort of situation, which I hear is the the new hip thing to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not, actually. You can, you can quid or not quid for our quo anytime you want. But these people have decided to quid up, and we thank them. So uh, some thanks are due... To Annette and Brian, to Whitney, mm. to Kelsey, to Jonathan, and Uncle Doug. Ooh. I need you to give a saint. Oh boy. To Nat. Uh Nat. Okay, Nat. Um your saint is uh Saint Kiki Ooh. Uh, of the Malaysian <laughs> Peninsula. Uh oh. Saint Kinky Kinky. <laughs> yeah, kink, uh, Kinky's better. Let's go with Kinky. Saint Kinky. Saint Kinky is the month uh the patron saint of the month of May. Um, sexual inconsistencies, which is ironic for St. Kinky. Yeah, exactly. And uh, stadium fires. So <laughs> <laughs> They all go together. That's right. It all works together. Uh, you are, uh, you are, these lot are special extra to us, uh, and we thank you so much for uh, your kind contributions Indeed. to our efforts. Indeed. Uh, there are other ways to contribute, though. You can also just go to wherever it is that you're listening to this and just write star, draw some stars in pen on the f- screen that yeah, you're, that just you're a using. Just sharpie on the screen. That's how it works. Just <laughs> festoon everything uncle like with you know five that stars. Every, every, every uh, screen in Trump's household has sharpie on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must be true. But also, yeah. you can uh, just click on the, whatever the thing is that says five stars. Five or die, bitches. Yep. Five or die. Let's move on. Hey, fellas. Hello. Uh, Hello. Listen, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. It's hard. Sometimes it's easy to forget about it because it's not, uh, it's, it's not evident in the world, but it's Christmas time. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was called Xmas. <laughs> it, it, it can be <laughs> if, if you hate Jesus. Oh, I don't. Uh, yeah, there's, no, there's no evidence of Christmas. I, I, my hotel lobby that I had to hack my way through to get to my room today... <laughs> There are so many fucking Christmas trees. It's like the end of The Shining <laughs> down there. Yeah, there's no well, way of knowing it's Christmas. At least they're not. Uh, at least they weren't brought there by Melania Trump. In which case, you would be truly yeah. terrified. Yeah. The, the blood Trump fountain trees, trees. Slovenian blood fountains. <laughs> um, I, I don't hate Jesus either. And I, I was. I actually had a discussion with some Christians the other day, and they kind of got to that point of why do you hate Jesus? And I'm like, I don't. I don't hate Jesus any more than I hate Thanos or Hans Gruber. Right. They don't yeah. exist. 
<laughs> right. Uh, but before we get into all of this, I do want to introduce that one of the voices that our listeners just heard isn't us. Uh, and that is, uh, <clears throat> Paige, you're back. Hey, it's good mm-hmm. to be back. Thank you, sir. We've added, for, a, you. We've added a fourth white guy. <laughs> such, <laughs> such diversity. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, yeah, that's more, that's what we needed. Anyway, uh, listen, Christmas time is tricky. We've already yeah. talked, Paige, with you at least once about the holidays and surviving therein. But I wanted to talk again uh, with all of us here because one of the things that happens, and this happens uh, in a lot of families, but it happened. I'm, I'm going to use uh, my wife's family as as sort of the uh, the the avatar for this, which is that every year they have had a tradition that goes back decades. And that tradition is everybody gets together, the extended family gets together, and they have all of these different things, including, you know, gift exchange and food and all this stuff. But one of the things that they do is that they all get together and read Bible passages uh, and sing Christmas songs, but they're all the Jesus-y Christmas songs, and they just, you know, they, they read the story of Jesus. Now, as Uncle Doug has discussed in previous episodes, the story of Jesus isn't a story. It's right. actually many conflicting different stories, but they pick whichever ones suit them best, and they, uh, they, they go on with it. And then they ask people, you know, they go around the room and ask everyone in the room to participate. Uh-huh. Well, I think there's a problem of participation for those of us who don't believe in Jebus or for, you know, for our Jewish friends who are, you know, secular, but, uh, from a family of, uh, who, who, who are asking them to participate in their traditions. And I just wanted to talk about where we fall in that and how, and, and what we should do to sort of decide our level of participation and, uh, and deal with the consequences of either participating and feeling like we're kind of doing something that's against our own intuition and our own understanding of the universe or asking to opt out of participation and then dealing with the social pressures and the uh, ugliness that can come from family members feeling like they've been rejected in some way. So I thought I'd bring all of you fellas in on this conversation and just sort of talk about what happens when suddenly because leaving because a lot of us started participating in the tradition as believers right and now we're rejecting these traditions or or we're or at very least we're sort of changing our our way of dealing with it so i thought i i, I wanted to open it to the floor and just talk a little bit about what how to ma- how to navigate those dicey waters mm. i've got the answer Oh, good. What you do, oh. yeah, it's simple. And it's Great. a very simple plan, so be, write these down. Um, I put this on the whiteboard. There's no weapons involved. <laughs> yeah, does, does it involve a no. can of gasoline? <laughs> no, you learn Latin, right? And mm. then, then you get the big book of old Saturnalia songs, and you <laughs> sing a Roman Saturnalia song in Latin uh, while they're singing the Jesus song. Yeah, you can sing it as a descant over their, their uh, decking the halls or whatever. It's you know, too easy. You know, actually, I know that you speak slightly in jest there, but there's something in what you just said that's profound, which is, what are you offering instead? Mm. I mean, what do you offer instead of, uh, you know, singing something about a, you know, God in a manger thing? Mm. Um, What are you offering instead? Or are you just a buzzkill? Oh, I I <laughs> offer wine, baby. Wine, wine is always good. <laughs> That's not going to work with the Mormons. <laughs> but it, he did not, he's not offering it to anybody but himself. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Believe I'm me. I'm just drinking hard. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what Doug's actually offering is drunken Doug. <laughs> Drunk <laughs> Doug. Drunken dumb, which may work, and there are rituals to support you in that. <laughs> but what are you offering? I mean, otherwise, it's a little bit like basketball. You got two guys going down the court playing defense and offense with each other. And one's Dennis Rodman, and he's elbowing you, and he's trash-talking you. And that's just kind of fucking annoying, and it's getting to you, and it goes on and on, decade after decade. And finally, you retaliate and punch him out on the floor, and you get called for the foul. 
Mark, uh, Dennis Rodman was a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. going to say, Paige, Paige did not read the, the, the uh, fine print about no oh. sports metaphors. No sports uh, metaphors. <laughs> our, uh, the point our, is, our, our beloved Paige, nerd listeners. Back. I thought Dennis Rodman was the uh, the U.S. ambassador to South Korea, or North Korea. To North Korea, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's that or a too. porn star. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you're going to get called for the foul. Yeah. You've been baited. You've been baited. You've been baited, not intentionally, not intentionally trying to bait you. They've got a long series of religious traditions, and they're frankly unaware or intolerant and don't give a shit that you're not among the faithful. And so you're being baited. And then mm-hmm. when you retaliate and you're a buzzkill, you're going to be called for the foul. My question is, what do you offer that's at least as good or better than what they're offering? Are you mm-hmm. doing your part? You can walk away from the ritual if you want. Saying no to things is certainly within your uh, right and prerogative. You can fight, which is going to get you called for a foul, and you'll be a buzzkill at Christmas. Right. What are you offering? What do you got? That's a that's an interesting thing, but I I do see, you know, when so, I guess what I'm seeing is uh, a problem if you're if you're coming in and saying, hey, instead of blank, let's do blank. Is that what you're is that what you're saying? Well, if you're going to come in and say to a group of people, instead of doing what you guys have loved for decades, I'd like to do what I prefer. How's that going to go? Yeah, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound like that'll work. No, so I mean, that. I, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I think it's we could have a real interesting conversation about how to shape what are you bringing. Mm. Mm. That is if interesting. You're just, if you're bringing a no, I'm sorry, there's not a lot of life in no. Yeah, there's self preservation. You get to preserve your dignity and non belief or whatever, but there's no real vitality in that. What are you offering? And that would be interesting. Well, we talked a, a while back. We, we had a discussion about, you know, one of the virtues of being an atheist is you can kind of do what you want. Yeah, like such you, freedom. Yeah, it's freedom. And, and there are many atheists who love Christmas. And they yeah. love Christmas trees and they love Christmas carols and they, they don't even yeah, mind the Yeah, and we say go for it. We're like, do it. it. Do your yeah, thing. Yeah, whatever you want. Exactly. <clears throat> it's, that's the greatest thing about being an atheist is having that freedom. Conversely, though, if you don't want any of that stuff in your life, you don't have to have it. Absolutely. But I think your point is very valid. If you're going to go home to your family, and that's what they're going to do, you have to make a choice probably before you even leave your house. Is like, I'm going to just put my head down and get through this, you know, whatever. Or I'm going to blow it up. <laughs> I'm going to ruin it for everybody. <laughs> or you can and have blowing fun. it up is an option. It's true. You can yeah. blow it up. But you're going to be a buzzkill. Yeah. But can you light it up? You know, what do you got? What do you offer? Can I? Uh, I've shared this story on the show before, so I'll make it very brief. But years ago, when I my husband and I first got together, and I'm a creative guy, he's a brilliantly creative guy too. We were going to his very conservative rural Mormon Idaho family's Thanksgiving, and I was not exactly looking forward to it. But uh, he came up with this idea that was so genius, where we took a we found a Woody from Toy Story pin, uh, pinata. Uh-huh. And covered it with black crepe paper, so we kind of made him into a pilgrim. Right. And then we got oh, okay. That's not where I thought that was going. For a <laughs> oh, no, that was that was a different Thanksgiving uh-huh. that I don't talk about on the show. But yeah. but we I made him into a little pilgrim. Woody and Easter, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and we bought some horrible Native American like the f- souvenir war bonnet uh-huh, sure. and a tomahawk. And so after dinner, we said, okay, kids, let's go do the Thanksgiving pinata. <laughs> and they got to bash this pilgrim to pieces with oh, a tomahawk. Nice. I like and, it. And it turned into a riot. Like they had the most fun ever. And uh, we were the heroes rather than the two weird gay dudes at Thanksgiving. Man, it, see, what are you bringing? <laughs> you, you brought joy. Yeah. yeah. You didn't a bring riot. a buzzkill. You got to play with the, the ritual, the tradition, and you, you improved it. We can and his nephews that. who are now, you know, this was 20 years ago. His nephews are still talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty you, awesome. You really brought your best game, didn't you? I love sure that. Did. I love the idea of, so like, for instance, with, uh, with my wife's family tradition of reading all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, we do, we come in and, and instead of saying, you know, we, we, we sing along with some of the, some of the hymns and we, we, you know, re- respectfully decline to read the story or whatever. And we're not even asked anymore because now it's the young people that are all sure. reading the story and we're old as shit and then mm-hmm. we're not, not even invited to that. And bitter and angry. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I love the idea of not saying, no, I won't participate, but, but I'll, saying, you guys go ahead and do that. And when you're done, guess what we've got for you? Hey, yeah. 
That, there's something just gorgeous about that. We don't have to be buzzkills. <clears throat> no. Right. Well, in my case, and in, in Uncle Mark's case, the, there were, after we left the church for a period of time, we would go to uh, our family home for uh, Christmas, speaking specifically about Christmas. And it got to the point where we couldn't anymore. And it wasn't just, and it's a little outside the bounds of this conversation, but it's like, okay, I can put up with the tree. I can put up with these traditions because they existed before. They are what they are. It's fine. But it was the politics. Oh, and always politics. Yeah. Aggressive, aggressive politics. And it was the choice was like, I, that I cannot put up with. Either I don't come or we're going to have a fight. Uh-huh. Those are the only options. So uh-huh. we stopped going. You didn't want to do Festivus. <laughs> <laughs> Let's air our grievances exactly. and our politics. Right? Yeah, our dad, <laughs> was a, our, our dad was a former policeman, so the feats of strength, we didn't always win. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I like, what do you, what do you, what's your game? What are yeah. you bringing? You guys uh, <clears throat> just identify what you want to add. I mean, traditions are modified anyway. Mm. Yeah. Why not be a part of the process? Hmm. I mean, yeah. what have you got? Right. Bring I, the Thanksgiving pinata. Like, do I love you, that? You know, just comp- throw a curveball, and uh-huh. and you and I I agree with you, Paige. Like, there are, there are toxic families where you just can't make it work. So the best thing to do is just stay the fuck away, right? But well, you have to say no to something in this life, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, seriously, you have priorities about how you spend your life's energy. If you're going, to, and every Sunday dinner is a you know. A tribunal of Donald Trump or whatever. Yeah. I'm sorry. They're the buzzkill. Yeah. Yeah. My life's energy is not available to vampires. Right. Right. Sure. You're a vampire and it's up to me to decide if you are. Not you. Right. I get <laughs> yeah. to say no. Yeah. Um, setting limits is part of what you're talking about with the holidays. Um, some of you are so dynamic, so wonderful. Everybody's inviting you. They just can't get enough of you. There's too many parties. I don't have that problem. Um, <laughs> but if you do, you're going to have to prioritize. You're going to have to say no to some things and yes to other things. Right. It'll be according to your values no matter what you do, or you're going to sit there and sulk. Mm-hmm. But, so it, but you, you know, know if, you're, it, yes. if your family's toxic and you have to avoid them, that's if they're vampires, there's that. But if they're if if Dan, they're like Andrea's family who do love her and. Uh, aren't entirely toxic. And I think love tradition. That you don't right. need to spoil their fun. You can add to it in a different way. Right. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's really great. I. I. But I. You know, to Doug's point, I also think that there's value in <coughs> going to your family before the event and just saying, "Look, there's one aspect of this event that ruins it for me, and I can't come if that's going to happen." You're talking about communicating with people. <laughs> I, it does seem like that might be a thing. It, like yeah, in, that's beforehand bullshit. in you know collaborative ways as opposed to combat during the event. Yeah, God, I think you're onto something. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like it just seems like if you, I mean, and maybe they say no. Maybe they say, well, politics is our favorite time of the holidays, <laughs> and then you just say, okay, well, then I can't show up. But it does seem like if you can say if you can get buy in before the event. Then, as you say, the combat doesn't. Then, then you're not in the heat of it. Yeah. When you when you're trying to opt out, you can just you know if someone does sort of break the compact and and say you know blah, 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 about you know Trump's going to save the country or whatever they're going to say he's right. not. You're going to you you can say you know what I thought we had an agreement. Let's just steer away from that. Let's steer back to the you know the joys that we're the the fun that we've been having, and we can have you know. We we can have a discussion on one of the other two topics of conversation that you're comfortable talking. Sure, yeah, and you're not the only one that's uncomfortable, right? You know, it's not like the entire family system is reveling in the, you know, politically divisive conversation. There are other there's allies there, and maybe you can join with them. The question is, can you bring that conversation in advance? Right, shape it, collaborate with your you know like minded folks to create the experience you want, or you cannot go. Mm. Yeah, but what do you got? What can you offer? Let's modify traditions to support whatever it is that we love. We don't have to opt out entirely unless we do, and if you do, you know it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I think that that is uh, some lovely advice that we can that we can let people go into their their holiday season with. So, and, and by the way, you know the the, the podcast has those pinatas available for each holiday. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So uh, go to that, go to howtoheretic.com 
and click on the po- the pinata tab. We have a racial stereotype pinata for every holiday. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say right now, the Hanukkah one is very problematic. <laughs> it is. It's a very it's problematic it's true. True. pinata. Just be warned. But the oh, gelt yeah. that falls out is delicious. Yes. So it's awesome. awesome. the fish. <laughs> All right. Well, Paige, thanks once again for joining us. We really appreciate you. Ah, good hanging with you. Thanks, Paige. Right. Go ruin Christmas, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Buzzkill. Well, friends, that's it for this week's emotional show. Oh, <laughs> hey, we'd love to hear from you. If your sleigh bells are jingling, send us an email, howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you are a greasy, weird little baby limbo champion, why don't you tell us about it on <laughs> nine, uh, at our talk or whatever, on voicemail at 903-88-HOW-TO, which is 903-884-6986. <laughs> I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. Uncle Mark's blood sugar is tanking. Oh, God. Thanks to our patrons. We love you. Yeah. And thanks to Cody Layton for editing the show. And thank all of you for tuning in. Bye, friends. Bye.